Let me start by commenting uh, Strathmore Business School and uh, also Business Advocacy Fund for convening this very timely uh, forum where we are discussing the Big Four agenda. And as I've said, we can call the Big Four uh, agenda also the Grand Plan. We can also call it the Big Four Initiative. Sometimes you would hear uh, people calling it the Big Four Initiatives. And we can also call it um, the Big Four Plan. So there are very uh, many ways in which uh, you can refer to the Big Four, but always uh, remember to say Big Four. Right. So, but before I get into the details about uh, the Big Four Plan, let me share with you uh, something about uh, public policy management. Uh, because, as you have been told, I teach public policy in uh, Stratford Business School. And th th there's something about how government does their things, uh, which is important for us as Kenyans, as journalists, to appreciate. You first start with a big idea of what you want to do. Big idea could be a vision. Big idea could be called an agenda. Big idea could be called a plan. Big idea could be called a manifesto. That kind of big thinking is where we start. And after you've gotten that big thinking uh, documented or put together in a way that is coherent, then you have a series of other supporting um, aspects of planning that you must engage in so that that big idea that you have can be realized. And I'll just touch on some of them. Like for instance in Kenya, we have Vision 2030 as a big idea. And within that big idea, what we do every five years, and the first five years was 2009 to 2012, then 2013 to 2017, then 2018 now to 2022, so that kind of five-year modular. We extract out of that big idea what we call medium-term plans. So you've got the big agenda and you extract medium-term plans. And then from those medium-term plans, you extract strategies which will enable you to implement the big agenda and the medium term plans. Now those strategies then at a lower level, they are at ministry level, they are at county level, they are at departmental level, they are at state corporation level. So each of those units will have a strategic plan. <coughs> and then you go down and say, well, I have the strategic plans. Then you ask yourself then, are there some policy gaps that we need to cure or attend to? And I'm, I'm spending time on this because I've been asked uh, to explain whether there are new uh, policies, new laws, new regulations, uh, administrative reforms that are going to support the Big Four agenda. And so I'm taking the uh, time first to explain how public policy management takes place so that as we go through the Big Four agenda, you can put the things that I'll be talking about in perspective in terms of what is likely to have to change. And so, with the strategies in place, as I've said, you look at the policy situation, are there some policy gaps? Do you need new policies so that you can be able to execute the strategies that you've come up with? You also ask yourself, is the legislation in the country, this legislative framework in the country. Is it supportive? Are there legislation barriers to what you want to do? And so progressively you will find the national government in terms of the government ministries will be engaged in looking at the policies that they have. They will be engaged in looking at the laws that are there in the country to just ensure that they are not impediments to the realization of the big agenda you have, to the realization of the medium term plans for the government, to the realization of, or rather the execution of the strategies, 
and also the implementation of the policies that have been put in place. Then, of course, as you look at the legal uh, framework, you then, if you come up with the new laws, you operationalize laws by coming up with the rules and the regulations. And so I've come from the big level of the laws, the legislation, which is laws that are set by the national parliament. Of course, at the, at the, at the time being, we also have the Senate. So the combination of the National Assembly and the Senate is the one which would make the laws. At the county level, you have the county assembly. What the county assembly does are laws. But then at the ministerial level, it is the ministers, who now we call them cabinet secretaries, who come up with rules and regulations. And you locationally hear there are rules and regulations which have been issued or they have not been issued, and therefore this law cannot be operationalized. Now, as you are also issuing rules and regulations, you look back and ask yourself, did the law specify the setting up of new institutions? Because sometimes you might have a strategy that you need to execute, but the institutions that you have are not relevant. If you look lately, um, we'll be talking about the Biashara Bank. I don't know whether you saw something in the, in the press about that. So that is an example of an institution that is being set up so that we can be able to realize the strategy of being able to support SMEs, uh, the private sector, in terms of providing funding. So you might have to create new institutions in the process. You might have to pick existing institutions so that they can be fit for purpose and they can be able to deliver what you have. Then, in the process, of course, uh, you might have also to kill some institutions that are found to be either impediments uh, to the uh, implementation of the strategies that you've come up with. Of course, as you do all that, in the public uh, planning uh, arena, we sometimes also identify programs that should be implemented. And, and programs are very clear where you set up and, and specify some set of actions that you need to do in a programmatic way where you can identify what are going to be your inputs in the program, what is going to be your change process in the program, what are going to be your outputs that come out immediately uh, as you implement the program, what is going to be your outcomes, which is like three, four years uh, after the implementation of um, the program. And then you then uh, also identify the impact, which comes after five years uh, after implementing the, the program. And finally, um, as I conclude on this aspect about um, public uh, policy management, is a question about um, tying this with a budget you also have to make sure that you've got a budgeting arrangement that supports the plans that the government has put in place. And so in Kenya, we have got what we call medium-term expenditure framework, where after we have done the medium-term plan, we do an estimate for the next three years about where the money will come from and align <coughs> those resources to the plans that the government has put in place. Obviously, if you are not measuring what you are doing, uh, like one of the big companies in the prefecture used to say, you are just practicing. And so usually government uh, plans like this are accompanied by a very detailed monitoring and evaluation framework, m and &E, where you have indicators that are developed, and those indicators are the ones that periodically we use to determine whether we are going, whether we are coming, or whether we are not moving anywhere. Now, in the government institutional framework, the monitoring and evaluation department is under the Minister of Planning and uh, is one of the units that reports to me. And I must say that there is so much information which is available in terms of indicators, but I think what is lacking is communication. It's for you journalists and Kenyans to know that that information is available. We've got a lot of indicators. We collect a lot of information. Um, but now what we want to do is to make it uh, online in terms of it being available uh, without waiting for maybe a, a, a end of the month or end of a quarter for that information to be available. And so I spend that time 
just to explain about the ecosystem of how government works. Because there are so many moving parts in government that until you know how they are connected, uh, you will not be able to appreciate that there is actually some order and, and there is a sequence in how things are done. Lastly, let me also explain the difference between the ministry in terms of what the ministry does and in terms of what the state agencies which are under ministry do. Ministries in government are responsible for setting policy in the first place. So policy formulation will be at ministry level. It will not be at a state agency level. So if you are engaging on anything on the big four agenda and you want to find whether there's an appropriate policy, go and talk to the relevant government ministry. Now secondly, government ministries deal with capacity building in terms of making sure that we've got people who are qualified to be able to progress the agenda of that ministry or for that matter the plans of that ministry. So capacity building. And, and people in the public sector, and I say this very honestly, are very well trained by the way. I joined public sector 10 years ago after being in the private sector and being a Mwalimi uh, for many years. And um, let me tell you, what I've realized is that those people are very, very well trained. A lot of courses, a lot of uh, exposure in planning has very many PhDs. I've got people with a lot of experience, so capacity building. Number three, resource allocation. So the public uh, resources that are uh, set aside by Treasury, the Ministry makes sure that uh, those resources are properly allocated within uh, its area of um, control, jurisdiction, among different departments, among different agencies. The fourth one is um, standard setting, setting the standards within the Ministry and making sure that those standards are followed in terms of a good monitoring and evaluation framework. So those to me are the key areas where ministries do their work. Now, on the other hand, the agencies that are created under ministries, you can call them state corporations, you can call them authorities, uh, you can call them, uh, what else, these um, agencies, councils and whatever, they are the executing arm of a ministry. So ministries rarely execute. It is the agencies under them that execute. So when you are looking at the Big Four agenda and we want to ask ourselves, is execution taking place? I want us to move down from ministry level and look at the agencies under the ministries. I think I've taken 10 minutes already. So let me talk about the Big Four agenda now, uh, having spent time explaining uh, the big framework of how government operates. And this, as we know, is um, the priority programs and the reforms uh, which uh, we will be implementing over the next uh, five years, that is from uh, 2018, and this will go uh, down to the planning uh, period end of 2022. And these big four, they cover uh, four sectors like we know, manufacturing, which is one of the sectors, uh, food and nutrition, which is in agriculture. So. Manufacturing, number one, then food and nutrition, which is in agriculture. Those two sectors, manufacturing and agriculture, are found in the economic pillar of Vision 2030. Let me repeat. Those two sectors are found in the economic pillar of Vision 2030. The third one is affordable housing. And the fourth one is... Um, universal health coverage. So, number three, housing, number four, health. Those two are found as sectors in the social pillar of Vision 2030. So I hope I am helping to answer the question that I was asked, whether the big four are completely new, or they are part of Vision 2030, or whether we have done away with Vision 2030 altogether but I will continue to expound on that. And so let me start with the manufacturing um, uh, agenda among the big four. And in here, what we are trying to do is to increase the share of manufacturing 
in terms of its contribution to the gross domestic product from a pathetic 9%. And I say pathetic because since independence, long way back in the 60s, it has remained at that level in terms of its contribution to GDP, between 9 and 10%. And we want to increase this to about 15% contribution to GDP by 2022. And therefore, I would say this is more than a 50% increase that we have to achieve in this plan period over what it has normally been contributing to GDP. And so this also is, is to realize, or rather is in recognition of the fact that there is no country in the world that has developed without focusing on manufacturing. Manufacturing is key to us becoming an industrialized nation and becoming a developed country. And we have to focus on it because it, it, it brings in a different way of thinking as opposed to an agricultural-based country where we have a lot of our people based in agriculture, which is a problem. And so in order to boost the growth of manufacturing, the government intends to focus on some of the following subsectors. Manufacturing is a sector, as I say. So these are the subsectors that the government will focus on. Agro-processing, that is using our agricultural base and saying, using that agricultural base, we are going to develop a big manufacturing uh, base for our company. So adding value to our agricultural products. The next one, leather. Leather again, using our agricultural or rather livestock base. We have a lot of uh, cattle, uh, cows, uh, goats, sheep, name them rabbits, and so on and so forth. So coming up with a proper leather industry like Ethiopia. Ethiopia actually does very, very well in, in the leather sector. Then textiles and apparels. This again is uh, to use our cotton and make sure that Kenyans grow good cotton so that we can be able to make textiles and apparels. If you remember the Maslow's need hierarchy, at the base of the Maslow's need hierarchy, we have tackled uh, food agro-processing in a way, leather is clothing, textiles and apparels is clothing. So somehow we are dealing with Maslow's need hierarchy at the basic level in terms of what we are doing in manufacturing. Then we are looking to exploit our oil, which we have just found in the northern part of Kenya. So looking at the raw material that is available, given to us by God, extracting it. And I am told that if you follow the history about um, this thing about uh, what is anthropology, not anthropology, when you are digging out to find dead fossils, what do you call that? Archaeology. Archaeology and stuff. So if you follow that, you are told that the origin of mankind is somewhere near Lake Trukana. And then you say, okay, if that is true, we have lived for millions of years sitting on oil, and it took Vision 2030 for us to discover we have been sitting on oil, because it was within Vision 2030 that we were able to discover we are sitting on oil in northern Kenya. Anyway, so we need to exploit all the oil that we have and all the industries that are related to uh, mining and uh, extracting oil. Then the next one is mining and gas. We have discovered we have got a lot of minerals in Kenya. For a long time, we thought God was unfair when he was um, creating the earth. Uh, he gave minerals to Uganda, he gave minerals to our neighbor South Sudan, he gave them to Tanzania a lot, but in Kenya he did not. That's not true. We discovered God is very fair. We have a lot of minerals that we had not spent time to explore. Why? Because up till 2015, 2016, we did not have a law on mining that was uh, progressive. I think the law that we had was a 19, either 40 or 36 law. It's the one which was holding back our mining sector, which criminalized having a mineral. If you are found holding sand, just sand, the one that you pick in the river, 
and someone wanted to prosecute you, before 2015, you would have been prosecuted because you needed of a license to have that sand, which is a mineral. But the law has changed. Um, then iron and steel industry. Uh, if you go back to the history of uh, UK, uh, Britain, uh, one of the reasons for industrialization was um, the iron and steel industry when they discovered iron and they started using it. And so here we are saying we are blessed because the three raw materials that you use to make steel are in Kenya. We have got iron ore, a lot of it, in um, Taita, Taveta area at, with 67% purity. We've got coal, lots of it, in Moy Basin. And um, yeah, come, well, welcome. We've got uh, coal in the Moy Basin and Meru. And then we've got limestone, a lot of it. So those are the three ingredients that are used to make steel. When we went for a benchmarking visit to South Korea, sometimes back in 2009, and I was part of the group, we, we were sufficiently embarrassed because we went to this uh, a steel manufacturing company, uh, one of the largest 20 in the world. And uh, they told us, you know, in Kenya you have got one of the best iron ores. Uh, it has 67% purity and we can show you a sample of it. So they went and showed us a sample of the iron ore that they had gotten from Kenya. It's a sample. And that tells you that if we want to develop, there is a lot that we can do in that area because we have got the three raw materials that are required. And that is why if you look at the special economic zone in Lamu, uh, we are planning to have one of the largest uh, steel manufacturing companies uh, positioned there. And then the other one is production of construction materials, and this one how tied with the housing, because in the big four agenda of housing, we are saying that the materials for the housing should spur the manufacturing sector in Kenya we should be able to produce a lot of the materials that are required uh, in, in the construction of those houses in Kenya. So other key areas include investing in ICT, where we do quite well in ICT, promoting the ease of doing business so that we can set the right environment, having industrial park, industrial zones. One of the tricks that Taiwan used, Singapore used, and China lately has used, is to come up with industrial zones and special economic zones where you've set up a, a specified area which is very attractive to manufacturing. And this is something that we have. Uh, the government has been working on this very seriously. We received a lot of support and advice from Singapore uh, between 2009 and 2012. And uh, by 2015, we came up with the Special Economic Zones Act. So we have got a law that supports the Special Economic Zones and industrial parks. And, and, and that, if you reflect back to what I told uh, uh, you earlier on, where I said that as you do the big planning, as you do the policy framework, sometimes you find you have to come up with the right law. So we've got the Special Economic Zone Act and also the rules and regulations um, to support this. We'll also be uh, promoting market access and then fish processing. And uh, these special measures that I've talked about and incentives, once implemented, we hope we'll be able to significantly increase job creation. Now, on food security and nutrition, this agenda, uh, which is the number two agenda, is premised on the fact that uh, Kenya, although we call ourselves an agricultural country, we import food. I hope you're part of what I'm saying. We are an agricultural country, but on a net basis, we import our staple food, we import maize. We also import wheat. In fact, the last time I was in the private sector, I knew that we imported over 75% of the wheat that we mail in the country. We import tomato paste. And lately, I've been told there are some guys who make um, uh, French fries who import their uh, English or are they Irish? Irish? Irish potatoes. Because the ones we grow are too small. So when you make, when you cut them so that you can have the, the french fries, the cheap steak, it, is, it doesn't have the length that they are supposed to have. And their, their chips has got to have a standard length. So we put Irish potatoes. 
and I can continue and talk about a lot of things that we import, although we are an, uh, an agricultural country. And so, uh, in executing the, uh, this initiative, uh, we'll be looking uh, to make sure that all Kenyans have enough food to eat, so food and nutrition. And so it is not just enough food, it must be food of the right nutrition. Don't feed your people on bananas only throughout the day and say they have got enough food. It must have the right uh, balanced diet. And so to achieve this food security, uh, and so that we can also improve on nutrition, we'll be focusing on three broad areas uh, in the 2018-2022 uh, plan period. And where we are saying that one of the biggest solutions so that we can produce food is to focus on large-scale production. Focusing on large-scale production, because that's where you get economies of scale, that is where you have significant uh, productivity. Then also boosting smallholder productivity, because progressively, if you look at the smallholders where we have a lot of subsistence farming, the productivity is very, very poor, very low. And the third component, uh, in this area is actually addressing the cost of food because that is one area where if you are talking of achieving food security then the food that you produce must be affordable for the people so three areas and in here you can see we are going to be looking at how we produce the food we are going to look at uh, how we market how we supply the food how we price the factors of production that are used in um, growing food, the storage, the distribution, those are things that um, uh, will be focused on. Now, I move to the third item, which is universal health coverage. And here, the aim is to make sure that all Kenyans have access to affordable health care. Let me repeat, to make sure that all Kenyans have access to affordable health care. You might have health care, but it's not affordable. You might have health care, but people can't access it. And so there's the question about accessibility and affordability. And in here, the government will be focusing on reconfiguring the National Hospital Insurance Fund, um, and also making sure that we have reforms on the governance of uh, private insurance companies. Uh, because then we are talking about how to ensure universal health coverage. So the cost of the health is important. So focus on NHIF and other uh, private insurance companies. And, and here the government will be reviewing the National Hospital Insurance Funds Act, the law, reviewing the law. Remember uh, what I said initially, that sometimes you have got to look at the law, um, which uh, will be done for aligning to the universal health coverage. We'll also be reviewing any laws uh, which govern private insurance companies so that we can encourage investment by private health insurers and bring the cost of insurance cover within the reach of every Kenyan. Let me just clarify here on the health care side that if you look at our constitution, and I think it's on schedule either four, it's schedule four. <coughs> health is a devolved function. The component of health that is performed by the national government is what I described earlier on in terms of what ministries do, in terms of policy, in terms of uh, capacity building, in terms of resource allocation, monitoring and evaluation and setting standards. That is what the national government does. However, there is a disclaimer here, or rather some small variation, because the national government also runs some four national referral hospitals. There's the Kenyatta National Hospital, it is run by the national government. There is the National Spinal and Injury, somewhere in um, what you call Kilimani area, that is run by the national government. If your head is not too good, then you end up in uh, another national hospital, Madari. Uh, that is run by the national government. And then the fourth one is Moi uh, Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret. So those four hospitals are run by the national government. All the other public hospitals 
are under county governments. And so just make that clear as, as we talk about uh, delivery of uh, universal uh, health care, that we've got a split between what is done at the national government level and at the county level. Now I go to the fourth item, which is uh, building 500,000 affordable housing units, where we are looking to improve the living conditions uh, for citizens uh, all over the country. And here the government is keen on delivering these housing units by 2022, mainly in major cities across the country. So mainly focusing on urban areas. I'm saying mainly. This will provide decent homes, uh, create an additional uh, 350,000 jobs, it's expected. And it will also provide a market for manufacturers and suppliers, as well as raising the contribution of real estate and the construction sector to 14% of GDP. Remember, I did say earlier on, when we are looking at value addition in the manufacturing sector, one of the areas we'll be focusing on is the housing sector. So that as we are doing the 500,000 units, the components of making these houses or building the houses some of them are supposed to be supplied by our manufacturing sector. And so you can see an element of backward and forward linkages uh, being created there. So to achieve this uh, objective, the government will be implementing policy and administrative reforms. Remember I talked about policy and uh, reforms, uh, which will be targeting at lowering the cost of construction. So cost of constructing houses in terms of um, uh, coming up with uh, a, a lighter and not very complicated uh, rules and regulation in terms of the houses that should be built. Um, also the requirements about the materials, the shapes of the houses and so on and so forth. Then one of the areas that is important is improving accessibility of affordable mortgages. We did some deep stick studies sometimes back and it was um, a group of about uh, 50 or so experts in housing and we asked them if you look at the supply chain the delivery process of a house starting from land acquisition you do designs that is the architectural designs uh, you do the um, you, you 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 ask for approvals by the county government then you have a contractor doing the construction and, and so on and so forth what is the most constraining step in the delivery of a house and the one which emerged as the most constraining is financing and therefore in this big four agenda we are looking to make sure that we've got better accessibility and affordability of mortgages and here of course what the government is going to do is to raise low-cost funds uh, from both public and private sector actors which will be invested in large-scale housing production. And so, that being then the broad aspects of the Big Four agenda, let me mention then how this relates to our planning process. And we have been preparing the third medium-term plan <coughs> of Kenya's long-term development blueprint, Kenya Vision 2030, which we are calling MTP3, medium-term plan three. And this, uh, we are actually just about completed. We'll be having it launched in the next uh, three, four weeks' time. And this is going to consolidate all the achievements that we have recorded in the Economic Transformation Agenda, which has been implemented since 2008, when Vision 2030 was launched. And in here, as we launch the Medium Term Plan 3 and seek to implement it, uh, we are looking to achieve that overarching goal of Vision 2030, uh, which is to create a globally competitive and prosperous country uh, with a high quality of life of all Kenyans by 2030. So that is the overall arcing goal. And it has not changed, it still remains the same. The one that on 10th of June 2008, uh, I hope some of you were journalists around that time in KICC, we launched Vision 2030 uh, on that date. And so that still remains our, our arcing goal in Kenya and in the government. And so it is important for us to recognize and appreciate that the Big Four agenda, as I have described it, 
is not a substitute, but a first striking strategy for Vision 2030. I want to repeat myself. It is not a substitute. It's a first striking strategy for Vision 2030. And that is why it has been integrated into the third medium term plan of Kenya. The proposals the need for, as I had said earlier on, were already priority areas under Vision 2030. Uh, where I said two of them were in the economic pillar of Vision 2030. That's the manufacturing and food and nutrition was, was in the economic uh, pillar. And then the other two, housing and health, were in the social pillar. And they remain that, like that. They are still in the social pillar of Vision 2030. And so if I can relate again to Vision 2030, if you look at Vision 2030, we have over 190 flagship projects of Vision 2030, over 190, spread over the three uh, pillars and the foundations of Vision 2030. So these projects, uh, which are then Vision 2030, specifically, let me just say on housing and urbanization, we stated in 2008 that the flagship projects and housing development initiative, which are aimed at increasing productivity of, sorry, production of adequate housing with emphasis on equity and access, beginning with low income housing. That is what is stated in Vision 2030 in 2008. So the Big Four agenda, as I said, it puts a target of 500,000 units a year, which is informed by the developments in population and urbanization. If you look at the manufacturing sector of Vision 2030, the goal in Vision 2030 in respect of the manufacturing sector was to increase the regional market share of Kenya's manufactured merchandise to 15%. And this clearly means that the manufacturing sector contribution to GDP under Vision 2030 has to increase significantly. And this ties in with the Big Four agenda, where we are looking to increase the share of manufacturing from 9% to 15% of GDP. If you look at the health uh, agenda of the Big Four, related to the health sector in Vision 2030, and the flagship projects in Vision 2030 under the health sector included creating a national health insurance scheme, that is NHIF, to promote equity in Kenya's healthcare financing as well as scaling up the cover to allow disadvantaged groups to access health in preferred institutions. And this ties with the Big Four agenda on universal healthcare, as I have described earlier. <coughs> um, so if I can just comment on um, agriculture, let me just uh, say something here on the flagship projects. And in Vision 2030, the flagship projects of agriculture was increasing value in agriculture including bringing under crop cultivation millions of acres, millions of acres uh, of currently idle land and also enhancing fertilizer use. So that is what is specified in Vision 20, millions of acres of land and then using fertilizer. In the Big Four agenda, we are focusing on uh, crops that Kenya can leverage on and uh, we want to target irrigated agriculture. <laughs> so that we can increase productivity of land. And, and therefore, you can see uh, they are, that those are in sync. But let me just say something that could help us in this uh, conversation, that in the Big Four agenda, as we are implementing it, we are also uh, going back and relying on the infrastructure expansion that has been going on under Vision 2030. Because expansion of infrastructure is an enabling framework for us to be able to not only achieve Vision 2030, but the, four, uh, the big four plan in terms of mainstreaming Vision 2030. And so in here, as we implement the infrastructure plans, which are strategic support to the big four plan, we are looking at electricity generation, transmission, distribution, uh, transport infrastructure, where we're looking at the roads, the standard gauge railway line, which is expanding to Naivasha, then onwards to Kisumu, then thereafter to connect with Uganda. And then airports, airstrips, and the ports. Ports of Mombasa, we have expanded it. Lamu port now, 
I think the first bath will be open before end of this year. Yeah, completely brand new. There was no port there. New site, new bath opening up end of this year. The second other two baths opening by 2020, all funded by your taxes. taxes. We have not borrowed a penny to do the port of Lamb. And so, when then we look at um, the revenue uh, raising ability, um, so that we can be able to fund both Vision 2030 and the Big Four Plan, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that it is very clear that over 70% of the financing of Vision 2030 will come from outside government. So government, through your taxes, cannot have enough money to fund the big, ambitious projects of Vision 2030. And therefore, that is where the public-private uh, partnership arrangement is very important because we need to be able to have private sector participate uh, effectively in uh, financing some of these projects. Because a good number of the projects are not public utility projects. You can actually isolate the project, you can isolate the profits, you can ring fence the profits, you can ring fence the project, and you can take the project to the bank. And the bank will be able to finance the projects. And so, uh, our public-private partnership, which um, has also been successful in some areas like uh, energy, telecommunications, water, uh, should be able to support us as uh, we implement the Big Four agenda. Now, one of um, the strategies that I did mention um, in passing that the government is using uh, is uh, to ensure that uh, we have got enablers to support the manufacturing sector. And for instance here, the question about reducing business risks is very important. And the government has been focusing very seriously on the ease of doing business. If you look at the performance of Kenya in terms of the World Bank's ranking of ease of doing business, you realize that we have improved a lot. And uh, by 2022, we are targeting to be among the top 50 countries in the world, you know, moving from 130 or thereabouts some few years ago. And so this shows that the government is very serious, um, and especially in um, making sure that uh, the environment is uh, conducive to business. We'll be giving concessions to power pricing for heavy industry, uh, supporting in terms of uh, marketing strategies, uh, preference for locally manufactured goods in government procurement. All of us in government have to report how much of what we have procured is local content. That is very important to support the local businesses. So again, providing uh, relevant training and skills. I hope you are familiar with the TVETS, this technical vocational and education training, where we are focusing so much and what we have realized lately is that we have more capacity to provide that training than the people who are willing to take those courses. The PS for that Tibet uh, department recently told us that the capacity in Kenya is about 3 million positions, or that 3 million, um, what do you call it, establishment in terms of uh, how many uh, students we can take in our Tibets. But the current a uh, number of students in the Tibet is about 100,000. That's a big shock. And so we have the capacity, but Kenyans are not taking up the opportunities that are offered for training in this area. And so, uh, if I can just reiterate, there is a big role for the private sector to play in the Big Four agenda. Uh, if I can uh, recap, in the manufacturing sector, um, where are the uh, potential business opportunities. Textile, cotton ginning, apparel making, focusing on the export market, as I said earlier on. Leather, local processing of leather, good business. Agro processing, making sure that we focus on the crop value chain. Uh, there's a lot that you can do, maize, potatoes, rice, um, as, well, as well as tea and so on. Fish processing, livestock, fish, fish manufacture. Production of um, appropriate building materials, local fertilizer, uh, blending and uh, liming products, manufacture, I mean a lot of them, crude hauling, that is making sure that we are able to transport the crude oil from uh, Turkana down to Mombasa, or Lamu as the case will be, IT assembly, and so on and so forth. And so, to me, um, if I look at the opportunities that uh, arise out of the, uh, the stress on manufacturing, there are many uh, food uh, and nutrition, maize and rice, 
large scale farming is what we are focusing on uh, and also making sure that we deal with harvesting and post harvest loss uh, that uh, we, we, we sometimes suffer from. So making sure that uh, we've got uh, technologies that are appropriate, good dealership in um, the area of handling harvest and the storage. We are looking to place 700,000 acres of land for production of maize, um, rice, and so on and so forth, focusing on irrigation. What are the uh, lateral, vertical uh, uh, linkages in uh, irrigated agriculture? A lot of uh, scope for the private sector. Provision of universal healthcare coverage, again, a lot of um, scope for people to engage, again, if you look at the ecosystem, of uh, making sure that we provide good healthcare, uh, prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and so on and so forth, um, both for communicable and non-communicable diseases, there is uh, a lot of potential. I talked a lot about housing, I will not repeat myself in that. And so, as I conclude, I think I'm within time. Um, I just want to reiterate that the Big Four agenda has been incorporated seriously and um, completely in the medium term plan three. It is a way of constructing Vision 2030. It is not replacing Vision 2030. And it's a way of giving a lot of impetus to what we are doing as uh, we make Kenya a rapidly industrializing prosperous, competitive, upper middle income countries like Brazil, like Turkey, like Malaysia, like uh, Seychelles, um, Mauritius, uh, so that we can be able to uh, give a good life uh, for our Kenyans. Tied into the big four agenda, you will hear about the blue economy. This is my parting point. The blue economy is just looking at our water bodies and saying, if you look at the big cities in the world, a lot of them started where there were big rivers or along um, oceans and seas. And we are saying Kenya has a long coastline, the Indian Ocean. And we are saying that there is a lot of scope for Kenya to exploit the, the waters along in the Indian Ocean which belong to Kenya. So you are going to hear a lot of conversation about how we can harvest the resources in the blue economy including fishing, including mining, including tourism, including sports, and so much. There is a big international conference that is planned sometimes in November, uh, which will be held in Nairobi, where we want to attract a lot of people and, and expose them to the potential of the blue economy in Kenya and how that can support the Big Four agenda, like manufacturing and so on and so forth. So just to close, I want to thank you uh, as organizers for this forum, uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of this very, very important discussion. I thank you journalists, um, there's a research that was done sometimes back 2010 and also repeated in 2014, which shows that the most believable group of people is the media in Kenya, more believable than the clergy. And so I want to thank you for, <laughs> I want to thank you for coming and I hope that uh, you'll take good information out of what I've said so that you can disseminate and share it uh, with them. Um, the population in Kenya and thank you very much.